Thanks for joining us for today's live Q&A. The whole idea is you put your questions in and we answer them. So Trace here, one of our amazing customer support bees in the hive, will be reading out your questions and I'll do my best to answer them. And if you've got, quest if you've got answers to other people's questions, then chime in, help answer them as well. It's amazing to see people doing that from all over the world. Also let us know where in about, whereabouts in the world you are. Now, we put oil in the tray under here to catch some hive beetles, and that worked quite well. Now I've cleaned out the oil, and what I thought I'd show you is how to make a hive beetle trap using soapy water. So in the bottom here of the Flow Hive 2, we have a tray. Now that's your pest management tray, and if you have a look under here, there is a screened bottom board. You can see up underneath the hive, there's a screen. The bees chase those beetles all around the hive and they'll fall through that screen and into this tray area. So to make a trap using soapy water, all we need to do is add a bit of detergent like this. Now this kind of trap I would just use in the hot summer months. Reason being is in the winter time if you have a whole lot of water in the tray down the bottom you might get excess condensation coming up. So a bit of detergent like that. Put some water in the tray. You don't need to fill it up too much or it'll be hard to handle. Now the thing is with water is it will evaporate so you will need to top it up more often than if you're using cooking oil to catch the hive beetles. But it's a bit cleaner because detergent and water is a great way to clean the tray. So what you're doing now is you're putting it in here like this and you've had a look underneath to make sure you're not trapping any bees in that area. And all we do is insert the tray back in and then put our vented cover back in place. Now if we push this in, make sure it's touching the tray because that creates the seal for any bees that are underneath and you don't want them to get up in between here and the tray or they might drown in the soapy like water because soap sure actually clogs up the breathing apparatuses of insects. So you don't want bees in there. What you want is the hive beetles to get trapped in there and that'll lessen the hive beetle load in your hive and just give them a hand. Super important to do in hot steamy times when your colony is a bit weak. If you have a look here, the bees are starting to use these cells. You can even see a hive beetle just crawling around in this cell here. So that's pretty normal for this area to see hive beetles. They'll be chasing them into cells like that to make sure they can't get around and lay eggs in your hive. So that's it. Great easy way to make a hive beetle trap using the pest management tray. Now what we're going to do today is a brood inspection while we answer your questions. But first of all, let's just have a look at what's going on in this super. This has been on a, a few weeks now, probably about three or four weeks, and we're seeing a bit of activity, but we're not seeing a whole lot. Now if we had a flow on that would stimulate the queen to lay more eggs, there'd be more bees and there'd be an abundance of nectar, and you'd start to see them filling the cells. But if all of that isn't lined up, it will take some time. Now, if we dial back a few videos, you'll see we scraped some wax off the brood frames. Look, there's another little hive beetle there. And there, they're chasing around. Let's hope they chase it down through the screen bottom board. Now, we put some wax in this area here. And if you come in close, you should be able to see the way they've recycled it and completed the cells in that area. And that gets them started on that little area if you're getting impatient, but you won't get any honey stores until there's a big nectar flow and you've got lots of bees to collect all that nectar and bring it back and store more than they need so you can share some honey too. Okay, so I'm going to get our smoker going. You can smoke your hands. And at this point, you should be in your bee suit wearing your gloves bit of smoke in the entrance like that. 
and now I'm going to make sure I've got my B suit on. In this case, I'm wearing the B jacket. This is my favorite because I just like to wear pants. It's easy to throw on a jacket and away you go. A full B suit is also a good idea. And have your gloves handy or if you're new to beekeeping, make sure you're wearing your gloves as well. Okay, Velcro goes over the top of the three zips. So you zip the one up and the other one and then the other one across over the top of it and the Velcro down like that. Next we're going to take the gabled roof off and we have a choice now. We could just crack the super off and get straight into the brood nest or we could just have a little look at the flow frames too. So while we're here, why not do a little flow frame inspection just out of interest to see if they have actually started on the inside of the hive here. So I'm going to pop the uh, lid off like this and we're seeing a lot of bees which is great. And we're also seeing quite a lot of hive beetles, which you can see here running around. Sorry, beetles, you didn't mean to be in the wrong place in the world, but too many beetles can turn your hive into a hive beetle nest instead of a beehive. So it is something as a beekeeper is reducing the number of beetles in your hive in those humid times if your colony is weak. Most of the time, the bees will keep them under check and you don't need to do much about them but when the hive's weak activate your beetle trap next i'll show you how to remove a flow frame and i might just pull one out in the middle just to see if there's any activity on it removing the key access cover on the flow frames there is three lift points one is under here, one is here if you need it, and the other one is here with the J under the end, just how you lift normal frames up. There we go. So coming up, what are we seeing on the frames? So what I'm seeing is the bees have been busy at work and they've bridged all the gaps now. In the design, when my father and I were inventing this, we left gaps for the bees' knees and wings. So when the parts move, they can't catch the bees in the cells. So you can see the little bridges, the wax colors almost identical in this case to the flow frames. So it's a little bit hard to see, but sometimes they'll be recycling wax and it's much easier to see the little joins they've put between the parts. Neat. Good to see they've made a start. And I've just got a few technical problems here. We've got the uh, phone ringing. <laughs> uh, and just bear with us for a moment while we um, sort that out. So I'm looking at this next frame similar, except they have used a bit of recycled wax right up in this top area. So that's cool to see. You can see the recycled wax has a more brown color. Okay. So what we're going to do is put that flow frame back and we're going to do a brood inspection. Now, one thing you could do if this is too heavy to lift off because sometimes it's really full of a whole lot of honey is actually remove some of the flow frames to make this box lighter to lift off and then you can get into your brood nest. So that's a little trick if you're on your own and it's too heavy to lift the box off. But I'm going to put this back in again. A tip when you put it in is to roll it in. So you put this face against the wood here and you roll it in like this and down. And that way you maintain this flat face here. Sometimes they can overlap and what you get is uh, gaps where bees can get out. What you want is a nice flat face along here with no bees 
escaping. So to crack this box off, what I'm gonna do is just get my hive tool and lift like this. You can either go above the excluder, which is the black line here to stop the queen getting up into the excluder, into the honey box. Honey super, it gets called. And there we go. It's pretty fresh on here, so I haven't stuck it too bad. And it's pretty light because there's not much honey in it at all yet. So I can just roll this onto the end like this. When you're putting this down, I recommend putting it on a face like that. And what that does is it makes sure that no bees get squashed because they're in this area. And the honey won't fall out of the cells because you've kept the cells in the same plane. If you're on their side, then honey could fall out of the flow frame cells. Next, you've got your excluder. Now, when you take your excluder off, there's a chance that the queen could be on the underside. So we're just going to peel that off nice and slow. Have a look here for the queen, just in case. Every now and then you'll see her right on the excluder. You don't want to orphan her from the hive. I'm not seeing her there. So what I'm going to do is just lean this up against the hive so that if I did happen to miss her, she could walk back in. There we go. Next, I'm gonna use these shelf brackets and give myself a little frame rest here, just like that. See how that's a little loose? It'd be nicer if that was a bit tighter. And I can show you how to tighten that up using this little square drive tool, which is the assembly tool that comes with the whole kit. And we just twitch it up a little bit and then try again, I recommend putting the logo up like that and going across and then down into position and that way you'll get it nice and tight. Now, same on this one, there we go. We now have our frame rest. These are our shelf brackets we use for harvesting but they also make a nice frame rest on the side of the hive. Next we're going to get our smoker and make sure it's going to keep going it's good and we're adding a little bit just to clear bees out of the way there we go now you're using your j-hive tool to pry some frames apart i'm looking for one that'll be an easy one to start with i'm going to start with this frame here there's no burr comb connecting it and i'm going to lever the frames apart like that just using the hive tool levering to loosen up the propolis they're connecting the end bars with. Next, the J goes under here. We're coming up. You can see how there's still a bit of propolis connecting those end bars. So I'm gonna try again. There we go. And on the other end of the frame too, and we're slowly coming up. Beautiful, I'm seeing brood already. Very nice. A lot of brood on this frame, which means this hive is going to explode with bees in the coming weeks because, oh look, here's, here's one just emerging from its cell. Just there, in front of my finger. It'll take a little while to come out. We might come back to that one see if we can watch it emerging out of its cell and taking its first steps in the hive. On this side we've got an abundance of, of brood. So looking at the frame, there's a few things we can tell here. Look at the pollen on the legs of this bee. Beautiful yellow pollen balls. We've got brood right across here, the bulk of the frame, and then honey stores up in the corners, which is typical. Okay. All right, we're gonna rest that frame there. 
while we have a look at the next one. So now we've got one frame out, we can then move the next frame across using our hive tool. And now it's much easier to bring that frame up. And we're seeing a whole lot of brood here too. Fantastic. So the timing's good to have our honey super on top. We've got a lot of brood here. We're in our autumn, but we get a good autumn flow here from the paper bark. And hopefully all of these bees will get to go foraging, collect that paper bark nectar and bring it back to the hive. We're also seeing beautiful stores of bee bread where they've gotten the pollen, they've pushed it down the cells with their heads, they've added their enzymes and fermented it into a bee bread. Beautiful. Okay, this, <coughs> this hive's doing really well. This was a swarm that Sophie caught on the mango tree and it's really hitting its stride now. I'm gonna add a little bit more fuel to the smoker. Good thing to remember to do. Just by topping it up. Now if you've got questions, put it in the comments and we'll get to answering those. Oh, fantastic seeds. Hey, and might just shout out to, um, I think the, there could be some issues on Insta. So we've got Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok all working. So you might need to just change channels, but the, the guys are trying to get that sorted, so sorry about that. Um, now Clive's up in Mullaney, which is north of here, a beautiful part of the world, just saying they've had 10 weeks of non-stop rain and just wondering, so the bees have not been able to fly out or collect pollen, what are the signs that Clive no needs to um, introduce sugar syrup to the hive? Okay, great question. Mullaney, a beautiful spot. Yes, high rainfall. Uh, I spent some time in Mullaney as a as a uh, teenager going to the Mullaney Folk Festival and uh, lovely place to be keeping bees. Now generally this time of year in Mullaney you should be okay with the bees getting out and collecting nectar when they can and using the remaining stores in the hive. However if you've got a colony that's really struggling and there's no stores at all in the hive then yes you could go ahead and feed them a sugar syrup. It's something that I almost never do here in our region and your region is the same. However, you can go ahead and play around if you want to. So to do that, you could mix up a two to one uh, or a one to one syrup uh, water to sugar ratio. So two to one would be a thick syrup that if you want the bees to actually store some of that as if it's honey or one to one is a stimulating uh, ratio where you've got one part sugar, one part water, you, you warm that up, stir it in, let it cool and then you're going to be putting that under the lid. You can put it in a couple of Ziploc bags on top of the inner cover, poke a few pinholes in it and take the plug out. Super quick and easy feeder to make if you need to make one in a hurry. And they'll come up through that inner cover and then feed on those pinholes where the syrup is coming out of the Ziploc bags. Now, in regards to how to tell whether they need feeding, you can do a brood inspection and have a look. If you've got no honey stores around the edge of the hive at all, around here, or anywhere in your brood box, then yes, they are hungry and feeding them might be a good idea. If there's nectar coming in, like you see here, you can see the nectar glistening in the cells, then you probably don't need to feed them because the bees are finding something and that'll keep them going until the next flowers are available to them. In those really rainy times, the colony will get weaker, so make sure you're activating your hive beetle trap down the bottom, as we showed you earlier, and see if you can trap some of those hive beetles. Let's see if we've got any already. Yes, look at that. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So we've already got 13 hive beetles in the last 15 minutes. So this soapy water trap's working very well. And that'll give this colony a helping hand in this humid climate where the hive beetles are very prevalent. As said, they normally look after themselves if the hive's strong and you don't need to trap the beetles. But in really humid times, if you're worried or if the colony gets weak, then activate your hive beetle trap below. You can either use oil in there or detergent and water. Great, keep the questions coming in. Yeah, fantastic. So, Tay and M, you're saying, um, sorry, um, Callum normally does zoom in on the photos, but they've just been sorting out their cameras, so he can zoom back in now, so sorry about that. Um, Clinton's just saying, and it's just a bit of a good reminder, I suppose, Cedar, saying that whenever um, they remove the tray, bees can often get trapped underneath, and then he, he gets them trapped in the tray. So a reminder for people to check under their hives before they install their trays. Great idea, yes, and I didn't have a look then and I am inspecting so I could have caught some bees under there. But if you are having trouble with that, with bees running underneath as soon as you pull your tray out and getting stuck in your trap, then just do it in the early morning before the bees are really active. And that'll mean you'll get uh, less issues with uh, bees getting caught in there. And also the other tip is make sure this is pressed right up against the tray. Otherwise, there may be a gap for bees to get through between the tray and the vented cover. Okay, great. Great. Um, hopefully people can hear me. Someone's just said they can't, if you can't, um, to give us a shout out. Um, Cedar, just wondering, um, question coming in about why are you actually expect inspecting the hive? Like, what are you actually looking for? That's a good question. Looking from the outside of this hive, we don't really need to do an inspection. I'm doing it to show you how to inspect a hive, but it is something as a beekeeper you need to do periodically to check for pests and diseases. And if you're in a more demanding area where you've got a lot of varroa mites, then there'll be varroa mite treatments you'll need to be doing. And the frequency of that will, will depend on your strategies and what time of year it is. But here, we have inspected this hive a month ago. There was no need to do it again now. I could see a lot of uh, activity and the bees are doing well. I'm simply getting in here to, to uh, show you and just out of interest to see how they're going. So you can inspect as often as you like. Ah, uh, <laughs> that's just rocking there. <laughs> I don't really want that to fall below. So uh, it actually won't. Okay, next frame, we're seeing a lot of brood here, a lot of bee bread, which is awesome. A lot of brood there too, so this is gonna absolutely explode with bees because every single one of these brood cells is going to have an emerging bee. And that bee will be a worker bee if they're this type of cell. If they're poking out proud like bullet shaped, then it'll be a drone bee the male bee. All of these are worker bees, which is the majority of the bees in a hive. Cedar, are there any climates where beehives don't work? Uh, Antarctica you, is, a, is an area where you can't keep bees because there is no flowers. But anywhere that in the world where there is flowers, then bees will thrive. They can thrive in hot uh, they can thrive in cold with snow, in desert areas, in rainforest areas, in mountain areas, in the cities, on rooftops, on balconies like this. And uh, that's the wonderful thing about beekeeping is they're just so versatile. The strategies will change. For instance, if you've got a long snowy winter, there'll be some preparation you'll need to do with your hive before the snow comes to, to increase its chances of surviving through that long snowy time but uh, generally bees are amazing because you can keep them just about anywhere a 
Lovely. Great. Cedar, um, Mike's, this is a good question. Mike's asking, if you find queen cups, can you do a split with them instead of looking for the original queen to put into your split hive? Not so much with a cup, unless it's already got a egg in it. So the queen cup is a cup that is uh, waiting for an egg to be placed in it. And it looks like a little cup like this. But if you see a queen cell where there's already a queen in there and it's already in its cocoon phase, then great. You could just move that frame straight into your new box and that would give that split a real head start because in the next uh, week, that queen will emerge, go on a mating flight, and there you go, that new hive has a queen. A few weeks ahead, then if you just put a frame with eggs on it for them to raise a queen from. So great idea, you can use queen cells to, to um, speed up your splits. Right, and um, John's tuned in from Lismore. Hey John, you're a bit of a regular here and John's wondering, um, obviously now we're in autumn here in Australia, would it be too late to put the super on their second hive even if the colony is strong enough? Is it too late to put that super on? Ah, in Lismore you get a lot of honey actually. My brother keeps hives in Lismore and he's often outdoing us with his honey collection so he would be best to answer. <laughs> but, we'll give them a call. Yeah, I would say that you could go ahead and put on your super and you might just get a nice autumn flow and get some honey stores in it. It doesn't really get cold enough in this area to be a problem if you put your super on too early. So you could go ahead and put that on and hopefully you'll get some stores. If you don't, you could leave it like that all through winter. Beautiful. Fantastic. Not more larvae here. Just, um, I might just do a little shout out at just seeds at the moment. Just Instagram, sorry we've had to turn it off. We've just been having a few issues. So, um, which might mean you can't hear me, but if you can, jump to Facebook, YouTube or TikTok and sorry about that, we'll get it fixed, hopefully for next week. Okay, any more questions? Put them in the comments. Notice how the bees really changed their tone when I added a bit of smoke to the hive. Sometimes it's a good idea just to let them settle down when they're agitated like that. It's been a while since I used the smoker. I might add a bit more smoke actually. And listen to that, I'll put my mic nice and close. There's the sound of all the bees buzzing their wings but in a minute they'll be calmer than they were before I added the smoke. So Mike's asking what's best to put on the flow frames to encourage the bees to start using the the flow frames in the super? Is it better to use wax, propolis or sugar water? Always wax. If you put sugar water on them, they'll just lick that straight off and go back to where they were and there'll be not much change. So wax is the thing they will actually recycle onto parts of the frame. However, I don't ever really do it apart from a show and tell because I just wait for the bees to really build up in population, a good nectar flow, and they'll start using the flow frames really quickly. But I can show you how to add a bit of wax right now. And I'll do that by pulling one of the flow frames out and then I'll put it back on the window side. So if I'm going to uh, get a bit of wax off the frames, if, if your hive is ready for the bees, I'm just going to scrape some of this wax off like that. And that's what I'll use to just put on the flow frame surface and you'll get to watch them recycle that wax. So I'm doing it again here, look at that, there we go. So we're getting some of that nice wax. And I'll get a little bit more at the top of the frames here. Now what I'm going to do is show you how to put that right onto the flow frames. So it's fun to do the one on the window side because then you get to watch what's going on. 
Now let's see if I can extract this frame sideways. Okay, haven't done that before. <laughs> so there it is there. Now what you can do is just mash it into the flow frame surface like this. So just wait for these bees to be out of the way. If you do it right here, you can enjoy watching the bees recycle that wax onto that area. If we can get the bees out of the way. Okay. So this hive's got a lot of bees now and they don't need us to do this, but that's something you can do and they will actually recycle that wax to that area. It will speed them up a little bit, but you won't get any honey stores until there's a really good nectar flow and you've got a lot of bees in your box. So I'll put that back on in when we put the super on. But if you have a look around the other side of this super, we did exactly that a few weeks ago, about uh, three or four weeks ago. And you can see there's an area here in the centre where the bees have recycled a clump of wax and started to join all the parts of the flow frame together. So that's the only thing I would recommend doing. Some people do heat up some wax and paint it onto the flow frame surface. You could do that as well, but you don't really need to. You can just leave them as they are. A bit of patience is the best ingredient to get the bees working on the flow frames. Right, now see, so we get asked this question most weeks when you do beekeeping. Um, you don't tend to wear gloves. Is there any reason why? So as an experienced beekeeper, I've gotten used to how the bees are behaving and when it's time to put the gloves on. Now, if they were starting to, to really give me warning hits and banging into me and banging into my hands, and they might even give you a little nip with their mandibles, then you know that they're going to start stinging and that's when I'd put my gloves on. However, it's just easier to work without your gloves. So I would recommend starting with gloves because you've still got some learning to do as you tune in with your bees and learn whether or not they are aggressive or not. And then as you get more experience in beekeeping, you can experiment with gloves off. Nice idea is to add a bit of smoke to your hand just to mask that mammal smell and you might be less likely to get a sting on the hand as you work. The main time I get a sting on my hands is when I get a bit complacent and I, and I accidentally put my finger right on a bee and it doesn't like that and stings me on the finger. And I'm okay with that, but if you're not okay with that, then wear your gloves. Yeah, thanks Cedar. Um, Natasha's got, um, had a couple of issues with her super, saying that frame number three and number five keeps leaking a bit, I'm not sure how much. She's closed it a couple of times, just wondering if she's doing anything wrong. Okay, so uh, it's good to hear you've closed it a couple of times. What I'd look out for, if you've got a problem with a specific frame like that, is if all the parts are seating down nicely. So sometimes you can get into a situation where when you've turned off your flow frame or you put the cells back into cell formed position, that what's happened is the parts haven't moved into position. Got a bit of wind coming through here. <laughs> don't want the box to blow off the railing. And if the parts don't seat into position, what can happen is the bees will need to then complete the cells even if they're wobbly for their use. And you'll get a whole lot of wax build up down the, down the bottom here and when you go to operate your flow frame, that wax buildup will impede the flow. So that's one thing to check, that all the parts are seating down. The place to check that is right down here at the bottom. You'll notice if the parts are sticking up by that foot, if you like, that goes in there, it will be poking up beyond the hexagon shape. To fix that, then Heat is a, is a great idea and some pressure. So what you can do is put your key in the top here like this, turn it and leave it in that turned position and then put that in a black plastic bag in the sun and you'll find in a few hours all of the parts would have seated down very nicely and you can put that back in your hive and it's ready to go. 
There could be other issues like the slope of your hive uh, or there could be a problem with the actual frames. So do get in touch if that problem persists and we'll see if we can help you. It is normal for a little bit of spillage from frames. It really does depend on how the bees have capped it. For instance, if you have a flush capping down the bottom here and then a lot of uh, capping that's poking out up here, you'll kind of have this head of pressure where there's a lot more honey wanting to flow fast up the top than down the bottom and you might find honey spilling out up high here on the frame. Or you could have a, a uh, thicker honey down the bottom and a, a, a lower viscosity honey uh, mismatch between here and here. So that could mean that there's thin honey up the top, thick down the bottom and it's trying to move faster than the honey is here. So even doing everything right, you might find sometimes you get honey spills in your hive and that's okay. As a conventional beekeeper, I used to spill a lot of honey. Every time I'd lift a roof off in the conventional way, I'd be breaking a whole lot of comb, a lot of honey draining down to the hive and even out of the entrance. So I have never thought that's an issue. The bees are really good at repair work and cleaning up honey in the hive. If you've got the tray down the bottom, the worst that can happen is it'll go down into the tray. What you want to avoid is honey spilling on the ground and other bees might come robbing it and that could start a robbing frenzy. So if you do have honey spills that get onto the ground, cover it up with some mulch, clean it up so bees can't access it. Seeds okay. Emile's asked, wondering, is it okay to just start with one hive instead of two? Absolutely. Most people start with one hive and that's a, that's a great way to start. The only thing you miss out on is if you have an issue, issue with one of your frames, where, or one of your, <laughs> let me say that again. If you have an issue where you have lost the queen, and there's no eggs for them to raise another one, you won't have another hive to transfer a frame into the hive that's gone queenless. So you'll have to buy in a queen. So we always recommend to have more than one hive so you can be self-sustainable as a beekeeper. But one hive is certainly a lot better than none. And it's what a lot of people do, they just get one hive and they're happy with that because one hive can produce an enormous amount of honey. Having said that, having multiple hives helps because you'll get one hive that'll produce a lot of honey, then another hive not so much. So it gives you more chance of getting a bumper honey season. Fantastic. Tim's um, in the Blue Mountains here in Australia, so it can get quite chilly up there. Um, he's wondering, now that we're into autumn, roughly how many frames should they leave in the hive to get them through winter? Okay, Blue Mountains, it does get pretty chilly up there. It even can snow sometimes. So what you uh, want to do is ask your local beekeepers how much honey stores you need to survive the winter. Now typically they'll probably say you want a, a, a box of honey. Now that a full box of honey should be plenty in that area for them to survive the winter. And other beekeepers might say even a brood box like this without the top on, as long as they've got plenty of honey stores around the top, will survive the winter okay. So ask around, get a few different opinions and, and let that help gauge how much honey you need. If they don't have any honey stores, in the hive and there's none around the top of the brood like you see here on, on these frames. See this honey around the top. If they've got none of that, then feed them prior to the winter with a two to one ratio, two parts sugar, one part water, cook it up and put that in a bee feeder to really give them something to store so they'll last through that winter. Fantastic. Um, Cedar, so this is a good one. I've um, got a, a, a beekeeper whose brood frames are getting a bit stuck together at the top now that we're in the brood box. And when they, they're full of honey and they can't remove any of the frames for inspection, uh, when they try, the wax gets pulled off the frame and the honey spills everywhere. Hot tips, and I know we've done a bit about this in our hives before. 
Okay, so tips for your brood inspection if your frames are really stuck together is you will have to try and get the first frame out and that is thus and I looked for one that had the least adjoining comb which is this uh, brace burr comb here now so I found one that didn't have that and I focused on that and first of all I put my hive tool sideways between the frames and push them apart to break the propolis lines if you don't do that you'll likely pull the nails out as you lift the frame so what you want to do is create a little bit of space between the frame first and then once you've done that that first frame you come up nice and slow that's the hardest one to get out once you've got that out you've got the luxury of being able to pry the frames apart sideways so let's have, have a look here you've got this wax joining the frames together but now that we've got a frame out we can then use the hive tool like this wedging the frames apart there we go and now you can start seeing what's going on if you've got a bit of a mess you can start using your hive tool to cut some of that wax away doesn't matter if you make a bit of a mess doing that the bees will fix that up you need to get your hive so that it's serviceable so chip away at that wax clean it up take some away as honeycomb if you need to if you break any bits with brood in it right out of frames you can use rubber bands to hold it back in place by putting rubber bands right around the frame and the bees will then do their amazing work and secure that bit of brood right into the frame okay so good luck with that let us know how you go with your brood inspection great um um, Unmarked Faith is tuning in from Ohio and they bought a Flowhive 27 frame, um, getting the first bees the middle of April. Um, and due to March not being warm enough, they're, they're just wondering is it safe enough to feed them some sugar water for a couple of months at the start of, their, of putting the bees into the Flowhive? You can certainly, any time if you want to get your bees up and going a bit quicker, it's feed them some sugar water. Now, something I don't bother with here because there's always some flowers for the bees, but in some areas you don't have flowers. And it is common for commercial beekeepers to strategically feed their hives sugar water to get them going a bit earlier. So if they're using a stimulating syrup, it'll be a one-to-one -one ratio, one part sugar, one part water, they'll warm that up get it dissolved let it cool and put that in any type of bee feeder in order to mimic nectar and what will happen is that will stimulate the queen to lay more eggs because she's then seeing the hive is bringing in nectar and it's time to lay eggs and that'll mean that beekeeper will start with their hives with more bees when the real flowers start to flower so that's a common thing for commercial beekeepers to do to increase the populations of bees before the flowers kick in. So you could do that too if you want, or you could just exercise some patience and let them build up naturally as the season progresses. Fantastic. Um, and same on, on the same uh, person in Ohio, just roughly speaking, how long will it take for the bees, do you think, to build the comb um, and what's like so that you know when to add the super or what are the signs to look for when you're ready to add the super? Okay, great. We recommend adding the super once the bees have drawn all their wax out in all of these frames. So they're using every single frame in the brood box and you've got a lot of bees in there like this, then go ahead and add your super on top. The only caveat on that is if there's a long winter ahead, you might to uh, refrain from adding your super just because if there's no flowers coming they won't need it and all you're doing is adding excess space which will make it harder for them to keep their hive nice and warm during the winter so provided you've got flowers coming in your season and they're using all the frames go ahead and add your super and using a good nectar flow they'll really get in and start storing some honey in your flow frames which then you can share some of that honey too. Fantastic. 
Sina, just a question coming in. With this hive that you've got, how many brood frames are in the box? So this one is eight brood frames. Now, it's a standard size called an eight frame Langstroth. There's two main sizes of Langstroth hives in the world, and there's the eight and the 10. This is the eight size, and we also have a lot of the 10 size in our apiary. It's common in Australia to have both sizes. Some countries are more so 10s and other countries are more so 8s. It really doesn't matter. It's just slightly heavier to lift off your top box with the 10 framers. So that's the reason why often people in Australia choose the 8 size. Having said that, in colder climates, people do prefer the larger sizes on the whole because you get a few more frames you get a, a larger size colony which suits the colder climates because typically you get a compressed season of the honey flow where everything's flowering at once. Having a big colony to go and get it, it is great and also typically with the larger size they'll be storing honey on the edges which is some nice storage to get you through a long cold winter as well. Six flow frames fit on an eight frame box, so we call it the flow six. Seven flow frames fit on a 10 frame Langstroth hive, so we call it the flow seven, just to make it really confusing for everyone. <laughs> Cedar, um, do you re recommend using the pre-made wax frames in the brood box? What I like to do is just let the bees do it perfectly naturally, sizing the cells for themselves, building their own comb. It saves me putting in the wax, getting out the jumper leads from the car battery, heating up those wires, putting in the frames, cleaning up those frames, and having double sets of frames in the shed ready to swap out, keeping those frames away from wax moth and all of that stuff that I used to do. When I found out you didn't need to anymore, it was a great relief because it's less work, I think, to just let the bees do it themselves. And you're not putting any foreign wax in your hive either. It's all the bees making wax from their wax glands, from the carbohydrates that have come from collecting nectar. So I think it's a great thing to go for naturally drawn comb. This was a swarm dumped right into this box Every frame here is made by the bees with no wax foundation, with no plastic foundation. Great way to go, I think. However, you will need to do more frequent brood inspections in the beginning, like we did with this hive, to straighten up some comb if they start going wonky. If you're using foundation, the foundation can melt and warp and drop out and you can get problems too, but it will generally increase the chances of the bees building nice straight comb. So the reason why people use foundation, uh, wax foundation or plastic foundation, is actually so they can drop it in and that'll give the bees a nice straight guide and you'll get nice straight frames, easy to service. However, I find it's much easier to let the bees do it and I enjoy the process of getting in there and just making them go nice and straight along the comb guide by just nudging it along with your hive tool if they start going wonky. So all of these frames here, as you see, the bees have just done a wonderful job. All we've got is the comb guide at the top, which is like a long paddle pop stick, which goes in the top. And the bees have hung the comb themselves. Nice job. Nice. So does the smoke that you use for the, for the bees, is it just to sedate them and calm them down? It, down? I don't know why I said it like that. It is. While you can do brood inspections without the smoke, I do recommend using it unless you really are experienced in beekeeping and tuning in with your bees. Sometimes you can do it without the smoke, but the smoke does have a calming effect. And it's also a really useful tool for clearing bees away. So let's say I, I want to push these frames together, but I don't want to squash the bees. I'll just really gently blow some smoke, the bees get out of the way and I can push them together. Now having smoke blown in your face isn't fun, but getting squashed is even less fun. So I see it as a useful tool in beekeeping. Great, and are there any swarming issues with a flow hive? So bees will swarm in the springtime 
if there's not enough room for the queen to lay eggs. Now, genetics will really affect that. You get some bees that are much more prone to swarming than others. And if you've gone catching swarms, then you are really bringing swarmy genetics into your apiary too. If you're having issues where your hive is swarming a lot in the springtime, you might want to get a queen from a queen breeder, requeen your hive, and that'll really limit the swarming tendencies. It is their natural way they divide their colony. If there's not enough room for the queen to lay eggs, which is typical in spring when the hive is really building up, then the colony will raise an, another queen or even more queens and half the bees will push the old queen out and they will go and find a new home. So that's their natural thing. What I like to do to mitigate that is get ahead of the curve in the springtime and any hives that are overflowing with bees, I get in there and take half the frames out and take a split by putting those frames into another box and putting some fresh blank frames back in here and that will take away that primary swarming trigger and you also get another colony. Now, if you just were waiting around for them to swarm, then you might be lucky enough to catch the swarm, put it in a box and that's a way you can split as well. But I think it's better to get ahead of the curve because you can't always be there when they're swarming and sometimes they'll land high in a tree where you can't reach them. See the Leanne's um, tuning in from Brisbane a few hours up the road. Just wondering is it is it all right to start beekeeping now or is it best to wait till spring? So she's in Queensland. In the Brisbane area you will get quite a good honey flow at a lot of times of the year, I would go ahead and start your beekeeping whenever you can get some bees or take a split from somebody who's got an overflowing colony. You, you'll probably get even nice honey in the winter in the Brisbane area. Nice. Is there um, an issue at all in winter time with the honey crystallising and then how do you clean the hives if the honey is crystallised in the flow frames? So we got that question a lot in the very beginning. People really worried about crystallising honey in the hive and it not flowing out of the flow frames. Now even though we've got a lot of concern about that, we have heard very little of it actually happening. And the reason being is bees kept their brood nest warm and that warmth flows up to your flow frames and it's unlikely to crystallize in the hive. There are some types of nectar that are a lot more prone to crystallizing and it's unusual but sometimes you'll get crystallizing happening in your flow frames. But at that point if you're harvesting you'll just get cloudy looking honey. Now if you've had a colony that's perhaps they've, they've died out or the colony is so small and you've got nectar that's prone to crystallizing and you haven't harvested then through the winter time you could get crystallization in the flow frames and there's a couple of things you could do one is nothing just wait for the bees to get back on their feet and they'll get in there and use some of those honey stores chew away the capping chew away the crystallized honey and hopefully replace it with some nice liquid honey for you to harvest the flow frames from. Sometimes uh, in extreme cases where you have got crystallization to the point that it might happen on the edges of a hive because we did some tests early on before we launched in about 2013 or so where we actually took out frames of a known source that we knew would crystallize easily. We put those frames in, in the fridge, cooled them down, made sure they would crystallize, put them back in the hive and then went to harvest to simulate what would happen. And what we found is we could still turn the key, a little bit of honey came out but most of the crystallized honey just stayed in the frame. But that process of attempting to harvest was a, uh, a, a clear change to the frames and what the bees did is they stripped off all the cap capping and ripped out all the crystallized honey, replaced it with, with nectar, produced some more honey and away we went with no issue. So generally crystallization isn't an issue. Let us know if it has happened to you and whether it has become an issue but so far we haven't heard of it 
as a problem. Great, thanks. And um, Chuck, who's, who tunes in, he's on Facebook and just giving some good tips, Cedar, about um, the smoker and, and you lo like without the gloves and, and putting the smoke on your hands to hide your pheromones and to hide your scent. Um, <laughs> so he's just tuning in there, giving a few tips on using the smoker before you go into your beehive. Great, Chuck. It's uh, always good to have, uh, have you tuning in and helping answer questions. Um, Mike's, Mike's in Colorado and was thinking of um, building, building up more brood and flowers before, the, for, before he puts the, uh, the hive together. Just wondering if putting a pollen patty in the brood box would help before all the flowers come on. I have very little experience with pollen patties because we have an abundance of flowers all year round here. However, if you've got experience with those or you live in an area where it's common to use pollen patties, chime in and let us know how it goes for you and how you use pollen patties. Normally they're a fake uh, pollen made from soy protein and a few other things. So you're simulating uh, pollen when the bees don't have any. Commercial beekeepers will do whatever they can to increase the strength of their colony so that when the flowers do come out, the bees are rearing, ready to go to bring back as much honey as they can. So feeding them a thin syrup to stimulate nectar, feeding them pollen is common in that industry. Zeta, so roughly how many bees are in a hive like this? So at a guess, this hive, they're, they're not completely full yet. We've probably got about 25,000 bees in here. Most of them are female worker bees. One will be a queen and there'll be about probably three to 600 drones in here, which are your male bees. When you put the brood box back together, Cedar, do you have to put it in the same order that you took them out from? I have tried to do that. The reason being, and that's a, a good tip here, is if you squash comb against comb like that, let's say you've muddled all your frames around and you've, you've got a bit of honeycomb here, a bit of honeycomb here, and when you put them back in, it's squashed together. If you've got high beetles, like we have a lot of, the hive beetles get in there and lay in that area because the bees won't be able to stop them laying. And then that area will get the hive beetle maggots worming through it. And in an extreme case, that can be the end of the colony. So do pay attention if you do have to move frames around in a different order and make sure there's not honeycomb pressing against honeycomb. I like to leave the little bits of burr comb on the frame. Some people like to clean it all up, but I'm leaving it here because that tells me a signature of how the frames go back together. And that way I don't need to worry about looking down and checking that honeycomb isn't pressing against another piece. Right. Um, Calvin's tuned in and might have missed the start of this video, Calvin, but Calvin was asking what can I use for the honey hive beetle? Um, and Cedar did show that at the start. Okay, great, yes. We're catching hive beetles today using detergent and water, just any old dish detergent and some water in the tray is a great beetle trap. You can also use cooking oil, which will last a bit longer. The detergent will evaporate, uh, the water will evaporate, leaving um, you with a dry tray quicker than oil will. However, detergent is easier to clean up and if you are in a cold time, I wouldn't use water and detergent in the tray because you'll get excess condensation in your hive. Okay, we've got one more frame here to go back in. Thanks for all of your great questions. If you've got answers to other people's, by all means chime in and help answer. It's fantastic to see a global community all learning about bees together. And I've learned so much from all of you, all of your tips that you've, you've, you've added all of the questions that you've asked and uh, I've become a much better beekeeper from just learning from a global community. So I think it's uh, fantastic to see everybody chiming in and helping each other. Okay, 
that frame's going back in. Now the last thing to do is to push the frames close together. Bees are quite sensitive to the distance between the frames. If you leave a gap, let's say you've left a big gap like that between them, then you're likely to get a bit of comb between the frames. What you want is to push these end bars together, leave any excess space actually on the edges. So I'm moving that over here. Use a bit of smoke if you need to clear bees out of the way and that way you can push those end bars together without squashing any bees. Same here, what we're going to do is put your hive tool down like this and just push it across. There we go. Tightening up the spaces between all of the frames. That's looking pretty good. We could move this one across here, even things up a little bit. There we go. Excess spaces on the edges, nice tight frames. And we're good to go by putting the excluder back on and then the super. So there's a lot of bees getting around on this hive now. They've uh, really covered the whole entrance here. And while I could try and sweep them all back in, what I think I'll do is just use a bit of smoke to get them out of the way seize the opportunity when there's less bees here and I might get out my hive brush here brush a few bees off this rim like that while I use a bit of smoke and that way I can seize an opportunity and put my excluder back in place here it is here with bees all over it I'll shake them right into the box and there we go and you can go on a bit of an angle like this and slide it into position so it swipes bees out of the way a good little tip there and while there's not many bees on top I'm just going to go ahead and put my super back on now it's pretty light there's no honey in it yet so I can just grab it like this and put it right back on. There we go. And careful not to squash that bee there. And there we go. Now earlier we showed you how to put a bit of wax on the flow frames and we got the burr comb right off the top of the frames and we can enjoy watching them recycle that wax to this area. Now, there's a lot of people that try to tell me bees don't recycle wax in the hive. Well you can watch with your very own eyes as they recycle that bit of wax onto that area into the hive. Being careful with this very last bit here that we don't squash bees on that lift point there. So you've got the wax in the window. Now if we go around uh, three or four weeks ago we did the same thing on this side and you can see that they've grabbed that wax and recycled it onto this area. There was a big blob there. If you look closely you'll see the wax joining all the flow frame parts together. You still won't get any honey stores until there's enough bees and a good nectar flow but if you're getting impatient that's a little trick you can do to get some activity happening on your flow frames. Thanks for all of your great questions. We've got time for a couple more as we put this hive back together. Oh, here's a good one, Cedar. Cedar, you love your bananas. Karen wants to know, can you give the bees bananas? Okay, well, there is a saying about bananas and bees. Well, there's a few of them, actually. There's one, it's like fishing. Don't take bananas fishing or you won't catch any fish. And some people say, don't eat bananas before you're beekeeping or the bees will be more aggressive. Let us know what happens to you. I've never noticed that myself. But sometimes people will feed bees to bananas. <laughs> <laughs> bees to <laughs> Let me say that again. Sometimes people will feed bananas to bees because it's said to have a pheromone that gets the bees cleaning the hive and cleaning out a pathogen called chalk brood. We did a myth busting on it. We'll put the, the uh, video in the comments below to show you what happened for us and whether or not it worked when we were using bananas to get rid of chalk brood.
<laughs> yeah, because Doug's saying bananas, a bit like what you just said then, Cedar. Doug's saying bananas smell like the bees' alarm pheromone, and they learn the hard way. <laughs> well, try it out. Let's let's see what happens. There's a lot of what I call man facts in beekeeping, where simply something's worked for somebody and it becomes a circulated fact of beekeeping. It doesn't get uncovered till 30 years later that it's not actually true. <laughs> so uh, myth busting is a good theme. If you've got something that you think is uh, works, but it's one of these circulated ideas, let us know and we'll test it out and do some myth busting and see if it works for us here. Of course, it's only a test of one. Usually there is something that's worked for somebody somewhere in the world. So that is one of the issues we find with beekeeping is something that works for you might not work for me. But having said that, testing it out is a great way to continue the learning as we all learn about bees and what they do and don't do. So I think um, it's a great idea to uncover those ideas, try them out. We've got another one with mints in the hive. Now we were putting mints in to get rid of hive beetles. We'll put that one in the comments below too. That was another myth busting idea. And you can have a look and see what happened for us. Thanks for tuning in. If you've got ideas, myth busting ideas, ideas you would like us to show and tell, let us know in the comments. Same time next week. Thank you for